Hello, in this lesson we'll dive deeper into the second phase of the engineering design process, which is investigate. As a reminder, phase one was called identify, and in it we committed to a specific problem and then listed the process constraints. Those steps were important to help us understand exactly what our general situation is before diving into details. The first step of the investigate phase is research, which should help us learn those details about the problem we are trying to solve. If you are anything like me as a student, just the term research might make your eyes glaze over and your ears shut off. I had that reaction because I always equated research with just doing online searches. Of course, that is a part of research, but notice that it is only one half of one bullet point on this slide. There are many other routes of research, and these other routes can usually provide more valuable information to you. The first category is working with end users. Who is actually going to be using your product or service? Their input is the most important. You can gain this by asking them directly. Examples of this are interviews or focus groups. But you can also gain input more indirectly by observing how they use your product or a similar product. A big advantage of this is that people often don't reflect on how they actually use something. They might think they care about certain features, but other features are actually more important to them. For example, if someone asks you what you look for in a backpack, you might never mention that you need it to be able to sit upright without leaning on a support. But those of you who have sturdy and balanced backpacks use this feature all the time. The second category is to learn from experience. Unless you are designing something truly cutting edge, there are likely many other people who have worked through a similar problem to yours. Talk to these people. A few minutes of their time can steer you away from pitfalls. This is a huge perk of being part of an engineering society. If you're plugged into a network of experts, it won't take too much asking to find someone who can guide you. You can also learn from first-hand experience to turn a situation from abstract to concrete for you. Returning to the backpack example, there is a good chance that your own experience with good or bad backpacks will shape your ideas for a new backpack. But if you're working on something more niche, it's a good idea to set up a personal experience. Let's say you're designing a classroom projector control box. As a teacher, I know what I like or don't like with these tools. But as a student, you may need to simulate a couple of classes where you act as the teacher and put files on the projector screen from different sources. And the third category is to research through outside sources. This can be the classic approach of reading books or exploring internet resources related to the problem. Because information is so widely available now, get specific with what you are looking for. With the backpack example, explore how backpacks commonly fail, what sizes are needed for straps, what materials can be used for the pockets, and so on. But don't forget about researching by studying existing products. You don't need to reinvent the wheel, usually. Take what others have accomplished and springboard from there. Buy a variety of similar products. Take measurements. List their features. Test them yourself. I hope this slide helps you see that research is much broader than you may have originally thought. If you don't research thoroughly, you won't be able to see beyond the limits of your own experience. Take advantage of all these routes to get a full understanding of your design problem. And after doing that, move on to step four, list solution requirements. Wait, isn't that what we did in step one by committing to a problem? Not quite. In step one, we write out a broader purpose statement, maybe only one or two sentences long, that gives the big picture. Here in step four, we move into the details as we try to list out everything the design needs to accomplish. There are two categories of solution requirements, constraints and criteria. Constraints are quantitative boundaries that define what a design must or must not do. After testing, you can answer yes or no to whether a constraint was met or not. On the other hand, criteria are qualitative guidelines to help optimize the design. 
These will not have such a rigid yes or no test result. Compare the first bullets under each category. The constraint, must weigh less than 5 ounces, has a simple test. Put it on a scale and see if it weighs less than 5 ounces. The criteria should be as light as possible. It doesn't have a simple test. We could always design something to be lighter, but that may come at the expense of other requirements, like strength or cost. It is likely that any design will have a large number of both constraints and criteria listed out. No matter what you write down, make sure that your requirements are specific and testable. Vague statements like, the backpack needs to be durable, are not helpful. How are you going to test that? Look at this short list of requirements for the design of a hiking boot. I say short list because there could be dozens more items to list. Notice how it uses specific requirements to clarify what is meant by an idea such as must be durable. The statement, tread must remain above 60% thickness after 100 miles of trail use, is directly testable. Make a few shoes, have a few people hike 100 miles in them, measure the tread thickness afterwards. I think you'll find this slide useful when you are asked to list solution requirements for your own designs. Obviously, the specific requirements will be different because you probably are not making boots, but the examples of both constraints and criteria, the testability of each item, and the big variety in the categories should spark ideas for you. At this point, we have talked about step four of eight in the design process, and we haven't even tried to find a solution yet. This is on purpose. We must understand the problem before we try to solve it. Einstein emphasized this in the quote on the screen. The mere formulation of a problem is far more essential than its solution, which may be merely a matter of mathematical or experimental skills. To raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old problems from a new angle, requires creative imagination, and marks real advances in science. I think this quote is even more true today than when Einstein said it. Following procedures to carry out a solution is not a valuable skill. Computers and machines can do most of that for us. The human element, the thing that makes you valuable as an engineer, is to identify and understand what problems actually need to be solved. So I encourage you, don't jump ahead in the design process. Don't try to start brainstorming on day one. Commit to a problem that you care about, then take the time to research thoroughly and list all the requirements you want a solution to provide. You aren't helping anybody by solving the wrong problem.